about bronze casting and maybe begin a little bit with the history of the medium. And what we're looking at is a recovered ancient Greek bronze sculpture that looks like it's been through some hard times. But it's important to remember that that's how ancient Greek sculpture looked. It was cast in bronze. And when we're in the museums, what we're looking at mostly are Roman copies in marble of what were bronze sculptures made by the Greeks. That's right. A lot of the classical figures uh, that were created by the ancient Greeks, like this one from around the third century uh, BCE, were made out of bronze. And then when the Romans, uh, when Roman culture developed, they were very, very good at making copies of the Greek bronzes. Uh, most of the Greek bronzes have been lost, they've been melted down, uh, a very few survive, this is one of them. Oftentimes the ones that survived um, were lost at sea and yeah. so were well preserved underwater like, like this, this one, one yeah. uh, which is why it has that mottled finish that wasn't originally how it would look, but you're absolutely right. A lot of the things that we think of as typical Greek sculpture in marble are actually Roman copies right. in marble of the Greek and, bronze. And also that the bronze was often melted down during the Middle Ages because right. first of all these were just pagan sculptures that Christians didn't care about in the Middle Ages, but also bronze was a val and still is a valuable metal. It's very, very valuable metal, uh, mostly made out of uh, copper and tin, and it's uh, expensive just in terms of a raw material. That's right, and so if you don't like the sculpture that's made out of bronze, you would rather melt it down and make it something into something that you do like, like for instance a church bell or a cannon. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that oftentimes uh, when marble sculpture, excuse me, when bronze sculpture was destroyed, that that was often why it was. So let's, let's look at a, another example of a bronze sculpture from the Renaissance. Okay, here is a Renaissance example. This is a small bronze copy of the Apollo Belvedere dating from the early 1500s. The sculptor's name is Antico, which of course is not the name that he was born with. He got that name because he made small bronze copies of, of things antique from the sculptures. antiques, exactly. Right. <clears throat> and he worked mostly for the Gonzaga family in Mantua in the early 16th century. And what we can see here is an incredibly highly finished, very smooth and even gilded um, small bronze sculpture. How small is this? Uh, this is approximately, I would say, about six inches tall. Oh, it is small. It's, it's pretty small. And what's really exceptional about his work, and this is a good example to talk about bronze with, is that it does have this very, very smooth finish uh, and a lot of detail, and then, of course, um, some very nice gilding as mm -hmm. well. So the ability to cast bronze, and we'll talk about that in a second, had been lost during the Middle Ages and is rediscovered in the Renaissance. That's right. Bronze, aside from things like church bells and later on uh, artillery, uh, is, is not something that people in the Middle Ages were very interested in. And so the process of casting bronze for art, for sculpture, wasn't something that was done very much, especially in a large scale. And it is something that in the Renaissance, they start making foundries again to create this kind of uh, work. But let's talk about process a little bit, okay. because when we're looking at the finished product, um, it might be very spectacular to the eye, but in fact, it doesn't reveal very much of how it was made. And in fact, the making of the object is purposefully Very hidden behind the, the pristine finish that mm -hmm. we see a lot, especially in Renaissance sculpture. Let's look at a diagram that explains the process that was current. And this process is called? This is the lost wax process, which is a process that the ancients used and then is used again uh, in the Renaissance. And still used today. Oftentimes used today, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, the first step is that you want to create a core you want to create not what your finished sculpture is going to look like, but just the general shape of it out of clay. And that is what you're looking at in the very center of this diagram. Um, the next step then is that you want to cover that core with wax. And it's just a skin, just a couple of centimeters thick. That wax that you're molding and adding on, you want to give that the appearance that you want your final sculpture to have. So really you're you're kind of carving first out of wax. Uh, that's right, but technically speaking, you're not even carving. No. This is technically an additive process right. because you're adding wax on. Right. Um, and so if you make a mistake, it's okay, it's just wax, you can take it off, you can add it on again. But you basically want to think of it as the skin on top of that clay core that's going to give you all the details that you actually want. The next step is that you're going to stick some pins, as you can see here, through the wax it's in the middle layer, into your clay core, and then put more clay 
around the outside. So you've basically created a kind of sandwich with a clay core, your wax skin, and then more clay that is uh, around the outside with pins holding everything in place. And, and we'll see why that is in a second. Of course, the, the clay would have to harden. That's right. You this. do want the clay to harden. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step is you're actually going to heat up the whole thing. You're going to stick it in a furnace. And that is when all of your wax is going to melt, which is why this is called a lost wax process. So we're losing the wax. Wax is gone, and now you can see why we have those pins there. Because when the wax disappears, if there weren't these pins holding everything in place, the clay core in the middle would drop down, uh, and it wouldn't give you the space where your bronze is going to go. So you're kind of creating a mold. That's exactly what you're doing. The next step is, as you can see in this side of the diagram in B, you want to pour your molten bronze into the mold. And the bronze is going to go everywhere that the wax was. Um, that's why you wanted your wax to basically look exactly like what your finished product is going to be, mm -hmm. because that the bronze is going to take all of that up. Um, you so you're pouring really hot bronze. Hundreds and hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it's uh, molten. Dangerous. Very dangerous. It's uh, very hot and you pour it in. And then you once you've filled it up and you think that the bronze has gone everywhere you need it to go, uh, you let it cool off. And you let it cool and you let it cool. And then finally you break the outer mold. And that will reveal your bronze sculpture. That's essentially going to look like the wax that you had put on it before. The clay core is oftentimes just trapped inside. Uh, in a lot of bronze sculpture, it's still in there. You don't hmm. want to necessarily get it out. It doesn't matter. If you want, you could leave an area of bronze open and reach in with a stick and poke it around and shake it out. But oftentimes, the clay core is still inside. The thing is, when you've removed your outer layer of clay and it finally reveals the bronze, the bronze is very, very rough. I mean, the, your sculpture right. is not finished by any means. It has a lot of bubbles. It, mm -hmm. It's very imperfections. a lot of imperfections. Plus, you also have all of these pins that are still sticking mm -hmm. out of it. And so the next process, which is incredibly time consuming and oftentimes the most time consuming part of making a bronze sculpture, is finishing or chasing the bronze. You want to polish down the areas you want to have smooth, get rid of any imperfections, cut off the pins and other things that might be sticking out. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very labor-intensive process. And at this point, if you want to think of it in this way, you're actually working reductively now because you're removing taking anything, mm -hmm. taking away things that you don't want there to be anymore. It's at this stage that you can create details that might have been too fine to achieve with the wax that would have been lost in the process. So would you reheat the bronze to make these? Um, you details, can do that. Like the ones we see on the helmet here of Goliath from That's Donatello's right. David and Goliath. This is the head of Goliath from Donatello's sculpture of the mid-15th century. And you can see things like the texture in mm -hmm. here in between these vegetal designs or the texture here, this kind of hammering that gave you these uh, circular texture marks even here like on the uh, sandals. Uh, this is all created afterwards. Uh, the fine details even like eyelashes or other kinds of things and other sculptures. So just by hammering? Just by hammering. Um, and then... Maybe using a stencil and hammering? You could do that sometimes as well. There are a whole different tools that different artists in their workshops would use and of course those change slightly over time and in different regions but generally remain the same. Uh, here we're looking at a sculpture by John Bologna from the late 16th century. And this is a good artist to talk about when we talk about the fine finish that can be achieved in the end, yeah. much like the first example we looked at. Um, it's polished down, sometimes with oils and even some pigments sometimes. And uh, depending on the materials that are in your bronze, of course, it can have different kinds of tones and colors. But the idea is then to give it this incredibly lustrous finish, and you have really no sense of the casting process, of no. the wax, of how rough and um, unfinished it looked when it was first made. And this is the reason all of these levels of technique and procedures that went into making the bronze, this is the reason why it's so expensive. Uh, we've mentioned elsewhere that marble sculpture costs 10 times more than wood sculpture. Well, bronze sculpture costs even 10 times more than marble. Wow. So if you're going to make something out of wood, it might have a certain cost. But if you're going to make it out of bronze, that same sculpture would cost literally 100 mm -hmm. times more. But of course, it's a much more durable medium Very than durable wood, medium. and even more durable than stone. It's more durable than wood, of course, and it is more durable than marble. Uh, marble, although it's a rock, is very brittle. Mm -hmm. You can think of it almost like chalk. Um, and so 
marble can't really stand on its own two feet, if you right. want to think of a large That's sculpture. That's why there are the, those trees and everything You often at have something supporting the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Bronze, instead, has incredibly good tensile strength, and so you can achieve things in bronze that you would never be able to achieve in marble. Mm -hmm.